Okay. So anyway, um, our speaker today, uh, I was very interested in, in reading his biography and speaking with him tonight because we share a mutual love for Florence, Italy, where we both have been fortunate enough to spend uh, a great deal of time. But as I was looking over his portfolio, I was struck by two things. One was that we don't have one damn piece of his public art here in Arizona. Uh, so he's, he's sold a lot at Scottsdale when he was represented there. But his, he has public art in a lot of other states here in the, in the Southwest and the Midwest. We don't have one here in Tucson yet, but maybe we can do something. We can fix it. We can fix that. <laughs> right. And, um, and the other thing I would say uh, about George is I looked over uh, his website and saw the wonderful work that he and his wife, Cammie, who's also here tonight. Cammie, can you be recognized and stand for us for one minute? She is a, she is a, she's a wonderful sculptor in, in her own right. And so as I was looking at uh, George's work, I thought that, you know, if Norman Rockwell had been a sculptor, maybe he would have been George Lundin. Because George captures something about America and Americans that Norman Rockwell was one of the few artists before him that had a chance to do that. So I look at his, his pictures, uh, his, his sculptures of, uh, of Americans, prominent, unknown, uh, they're all very moving and, and inspiring, and I am. I think we're all fortunate to have him tonight. So let's give a warm Friends of Western Art welcome to George Lundin. Thank you, Chuck. And first of all, I want to tell you that I've worked with uh, Hugh on my slideshow, uh, and he he got a little uh, 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 encouragement there. But I want to tell you. If anything screws up, it's all his fault. <laughs> and he did forget the clicker tonight. He had to drive all the way home and get my clicker. Anyway, my name is George Lundin. I'm a, I'm a part-time sculptor. I, I, I still paint signs on the side. <laughs> if you need any billboards done, I can, I can work on those for you. Uh, but I want to thank the Friends of Western Art for inviting me. I understand I was a last minute choice, but <laughs> my wife was married before too. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> this is a beautiful Cami Lundin. She's the one in the rattlesnake pants. <laughs> and she means it. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to uh, I grew up in I grew up in a small town in Central America. And uh, uh, from there, I went off to uh, college in uh, a little place called Hastings College. I was an art major, and, and at that point, I, I, I did a lot of painting. All my painting instructors were abstract expressionists, but I, I saw a piece of sculpture in an art show back in 1967 that was a, a beautiful figurative piece. And so I, I asked my professor, can we still do that? And he said, well, I guess so. That guy had a piece in the show, so you got you can too. So I, I started uh, bringing my friends in and doing portraits and figurative stuff. And from there, I went off to. Uh, well, I, I thought I wanted to go to graduate school, but I didn't know where to go because I didn't know anybody actually taught figurative artwork. And so I was literally reading the, uh, reading a Playboy magazine one day. So <laughs> nineteen. 70. And, uh, the articles. The articles, yeah, the articles. But there was a guy in there that had done these beautiful pieces of sculpture. His name was Frank Gallo, and I, and I, and I, and I thought, how did that guy figure out how to do this stuff, and, and where did he learn how to do it? So I, I called up Playboy magazine, and I got a hold of a guy named Art Wall that was the art director, and I said, where did this guy, this Frank Gallo, learn how to do this? And he said, well, he said, uh, I don't, he said, I don't know where he learned how to do it, but he teaches down at the University of Illinois in Champaign. So I, he said, and here's his home phone number. You ought to call him and ask him those same questions. I said, okay. So I called up Frank, and uh, he said, well, I teach down here. I take five graduate students a year, but he said, I've got my five for this year and next year, so send me some slides. I'll see what I can do. So I sent him some slides. About a month later, he called me up and said, hey, he said, uh, I got you. 
teaching assistantship, so come on down to Champaign. I said, when, next year? He said, no, in three weeks. <laughs> I said, okay. So, so I went down there and studied with Frank for a couple of years, and then, they got, then I got lucky enough uh, uh, after I finished graduate school to uh, uh, get a Fulbright grant and spent a year in Florence, Italy, and uh, was a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing there to work in the, uh, the academia, which is the school right downtown where you, you walk in the front door and you go into the school. If you walk in the side door, the first thing you see is David up in the back of the uh, academia. So, so I got to see David about every day when I was down there, which was, which was kind of cool. You could get arrested now for doing that. <laughs> I should have got arrested about every day when I lived in Florida. <laughs> anyway, anyway, let's uh, let's start going because I've got a whole bunch of pictures I want to show you. Uh, oh, that's me in 1968. <laughs> yeah, I had the same same mustache, a little darker hair. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. Anyway, that's, I'm just getting the just getting light the uh, light the furnace on fire. We had a we had a wonderful little founder right there at that little college, Hastings College, and uh, and that's where I started doing my bronze casting back in 1967. Most of you guys were just kids at that time. Uh, this is a piece I did called Hearts on a Swing. That was that was back then, and this was me with the. Uh, Pair of shorts on. <laughs> now that was a, this is a, I, I've done a portrait of this, I've done a portrait of this guy. I, I had this in my studio for a couple of years and finally one day a friend of mine came over and put a, put a ball of clay on his nose and I thought, well, it'd be a good looking clown, but it was a portrait of uh, a guy named Henry Moore that was a famous sculptor back in the old days. And so I thought, well, he'd make a great clown because he always had a, he was a funny guy, but he always had a scowl on his face. And so I thought he'd make a great, great sculpture and oh, it turned out to be kind of fun painting his face. And it's called The Last Laugh. And this one is, uh, uh, this is called Old Friends. And this was, if you remember when you lived in Florence, how many of those old guys would be feeding the pigeons out the square? Well, that's where I got, uh, the inspiration for this when I came back from Florence and did this piece called Old Friends and, and I was working on it in my studio and at the time uh, my good friend Glenna Goodacre uh, was redoing her studio in Boulder and so she came up and worked with me for the summer and, and while I was working on this piece she was working on her first life-size piece at that time but uh, I remember one day my insurance man came in and she said oh you you did a piece of old Frank Hepp, and I really didn't have a model for this old guy. And, and I said, Frank Hepp, never heard of him. Well, the next week he brings Frank in, and he looked exactly like this guy. <laughs> Except for one thing, when we got, when we got done, and of course, Lynn said, I've got to go get my camera. So she went out and got, got Frank's pictures. But the only thing different was I had an old pair of old man shoes on him, and Frank came in with a pair of wingtips. So I ended up having to change the shoes on the old things. <laughs> and this one was also an inspiration from Rome when I was there. I drew a small sketch of a couple of kids uh, about midnight at the Rome train station. And, and later, when I was uh, down at Texas A&M, I used it as reference and then did this uh, sculpture of, called Departure, a couple of kids on a park bench. And this is a life-size version, and I don't know if you can see it, but uh, a guy took a picture of it right after a frosty morning. You see how the frost sits on the piece? Made it a lot prettier than it really was. <laughs> and, you know, when, you, when you're a sculptor and you work figuratively, you have to have models, so I'm lucky. I had a, a couple of neat kids, and they would always model for me. This is my my son Warner. Everybody called him Dub, but that's his uh, cat little jangles and his uh, was that Uggy Puggy? Yeah, Uggy Puggy and uh, lunch uh, uh, chubby. chubby latte in the back. 
And that's, that one's called the Peacekeeper. So it's just fun to do people. This is my daughter, Annalise, who's now 35 years old. But that's when she was about five or six. Uh, this one was done for uh, a guy called me one day and said he needed a uh, sculpture for the front of his uh, shoe company in Portland. And I, and I talked to him and I said, well, I'll do this and this and this. And, and he said, and I asked him, I said, well, these are, these are going to be pretty expensive to put in front of a shoe store. And I said, what's your name? He said, well, my name's, uh, I said, what's the name of your, uh, your shoe store? He said, it's called Nike. <laughs> And I said, what's your name? He said, Phil Knight, but you can call me Buck. And so I did a, we did a couple of sculptures uh, for his new, uh, his new place in Beaverton about 30 years ago. This one I did of a guy named, uh, well, that's Ernest Hemingway. And uh, we did him for a, a city out in Michigan where, where Hemingway lived for a while. This is, this is a piece I did of a fellow from Nebraska. Uh, I don't know if, when you guys were growing up uh, and you were taking a literature class, an English class, and you didn't really want to read the books too bad, what did you go out and buy? <laughs> Cliff's notes. This is Cliff. <laughs> so, so the... Uh, there's a museum in Nebraska, and Cliff had a lot to do with the creation of the museum. And so they called me one day, and, and uh, I was already friends with Cliff and Mary. And they said, would you, would you like to do a sculpture of Cliff? And I said, sure. So he came out for a couple of weeks and sat for me. And, and Cliff now sits in the, muse uh, the Museum of Nebraska Art. So it's kind of a neat place. Uh, this guy is uh, Robert Frost. We did him for uh, uh, Dartmouth University about 30 years ago. Unfortunately, they couldn't put him on campus because the people in the art department said it wasn't, it wasn't really artwork. It was just a portrait of Robert Frost. So they stuck him behind the, uh, the uh, heating, the steam plant. Well, it's a beautiful little a little walkway and all the students take it and then about 10 years ago they called me and said well you have to come out because we're rededicating it i said are you going to move it on campus no but it, it was voted the most uh, popular sculpture on campus <laughs> it's not on campus so we went out and did that but uh they're always fun to do this is this is one i just uh we just finished up about uh, a month ago this is the clay this is uh frederick douglas and uh, we do a, a number of works for a, an outfit called Shield Sporting Goods, and he's, he's one of them that'll sit in front of the sporting goods store. They had Thomas Jefferson for a number of years, and then they flipped him over with uh, Frederick Douglass, because he's a little more politically correct these days. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is an old guy named Ben Franklin. We did him for the University of Pennsylvania for the Wharton School, and that was, was that 30 years ago, Ann? Yeah, that's 30 years ago. About 30 years ago, yeah. God, I'm getting old. Getting? <laughs> <laughs> I knew I wanted these people put in the back row. That's too. This, this, is just a, this is just a quick little study I did of uh, Winston Churchill, because I always liked him. And I, I called it Two Bulldogs. Uh, I, I, I just made a small one. We sold it. We sold a number of small ones, but I couldn't tell you where they all went. The larger pieces, most of the large pieces, I know where they go. This this one was done for uh, originally for a library in the little town of Beatrice, Nebraska, and uh, uh, the uh, the gal was a, a gal who was a wife of uh, one of my employees, and then that's my daughter down there, and a little boy named Luke that was the uh, uh, son of my secretary at that time. So it's always fun to get these people involved and get them to model for you. And it's, and, and it's fun to watch them 25 years later when they come up on and they say, you know, they say, you remember when I was there? I said, no. <laughs> anyway, this is, uh, uh, when, when Phil Knight called me, he wanted one of those pieces of departure, the young couple on the bench. And I didn't have any of those left, so I talked him into uh, 
uh, this piece of the old couple on the bench, and it's called the Valentine. So it's like the same the same couple, but 50 years later. And of course, the models I had for this were about as young as the people on the first one, so I had to throw a few wrinkles on them, make them a little bit older. And this one, uh, this was done also for that library in Beatrice, Nebraska. Uh, and I used a kid here, these are my two kids again, when they were that age. And this little, little guy named Donnie that used to walk by the studio every day, and he had Down syndrome, but he would go to work. And I thought, boy, that'd be a great kid to put into sculpture. So I got him to come up and model for me. And for a couple of weeks, he would come by and I'd take him up there for about a half hour. And he'd sit there with the kids. And he was the best model I, I ever had because he would sit there and not move for a half hour. He was a terrific. <laughs> and then his mother called me about a week later and said, you know, he's been coming over there at your place. And he came home with a $100 bill the other day. Where did he get that? I said, well, I gave it to him. I said, I've given him three of them. <laughs> she said, he didn't tell me about the other two. So anyway, it was, it was a lot of fun, but I did. I sold a piece to the, a guy in Topeka, Kansas one day, and he sent it back to his, uh, uh, he called me and he said, well, you didn't tell me it was a retard. And, and I said, don't worry, we'll go back, and we went and picked it up. So that was fine with us. Anyway, I think today you wish he probably would have had it. Uh, this is, this is a, another one. I, I like to do, you know, just normal people. People ask me what my subject matter is. I say, well, I try to look out the front door and the back door and see if I see somebody interesting. And uh, more often than not, somebody interesting is somebody that has an idea that's got a big checkbook. In. <laughs> but I'm a sign painter, for God's sake. I gotta see these a little closer here. Well, there's Frederick Douglass again. That's there's me. No, that's that's Brother Mark. That's Brother Mark. Yeah, Mark is uh, Mark's my younger brother. He's ten years younger. He came out to work uh, with me after he got out of college. He was a business major, and, and I I had a lot of work to do. So I said, Why don't you come out and work for me until you find a good job? And he worked there for about a year and a half, and finally he's turning around one day and said, this isn't so hard, I think I can do this. And he started off on his own, and he could. I should have broken his fingers way back then. <laughs> but he's, he's become a really terrific sculptor, and we work together on a lot of projects. And these days, uh, and I have, throughout my career, I've, I've enjoyed working with a lot of people. We used to work on a number of projects with people like Glenna Goodacre, Fritz White, uh, George Carlson, Jerry Balciar, my cousin Ann LaRose and I have worked on quite a number of, uh, of uh, projects together. And it's, and it's always fun because when you have an extra set of eyes, it's uh, a lot easier to work. This is a piece I did called Prairie Flowers. And just a gal in the wind. It started out as a gal hanging up a bunch of clothes and I couldn't get the composition together, so I finally just put all the clothes in the basket, and as the model was leaving, she put that basket on her hip, and I thought, well, there's, there's the sculpture right there, so I said, stop, and, and uh, uh, then started to work on that piece. And then she turned into a life-size piece, and so she's around, she's around the country in several different places. I do is try to try to do small editions of these life size under a hundred. <laughs> no, not that many. I wish I could. This is this is what I did for a hospital in Hastings, Nebraska, uh, and her name was Mary Lanning. She was a neat little gal. Unfortunately, she she died when she was about 15 years old. And this is the turn of the century in Nebraska. And her parents were pretty well to do. So after she passed, they went around the world and studied hospitals, came back to Hastings, Nebraska, and built at the time was one of the best hospitals in the country, right there in that little town. And so when they, uh, they called me up and asked me if I'd like to do something, I said, sure, they wanted a bust. I said, let's, let's do something a little bit bigger. So we did her life size, and now she sits out in front of the, uh, the hospital there in Hastings. Which one is this? Oh, oh, 
that's another picture of her from the bottom. That's what it looks like if you're the size of that little four-year-old girl. And this one, uh, this one, uh, uh, a little lady in Loveland called me up and wanted me to do some street musicians, so I said okay, and, and uh, she wanted to be kind of vagabonds. And as, it, as we got the composition together, I said, well, you know, they might look a little bit better if they've got some uh, nice clothes on. And so I did a small model of these, and I did, uh, I did the two kids there, uh, my little son Eric and my uh, niece Adrian. And then the flute player is my, my uh, sister-in-law, Betts, who's also a sculptor and terrific portrait painter. And then my friend, Danny Ostermiller, uh, model for the uh, violin player. And I remember when I got done with the model, Danny looked at it and immediately went home and started losing weight. <laughs> the bass player, I couldn't find a good model for it, so I got a bunch of pictures of uh, Robert Redford who just went from that. <laughs> That looks so intricate. That looks so intricate. How long, how long did it take you to do something like that? About two weeks. Oh, really? No, it took. No, it takes. It takes uh, by the time you, you make a small model and you get your design together, you try to get your, you know, your composition together, figure out what you're going to do big. Because you don't want to. You don't start big because you're going to make too many mistakes and you have to rip it up. So you make models maybe 18 inches tall, 24 inches tall. And then you take it from there and get your calipers out and, and start to make it bigger. Nowadays we digitize everything and we put it on a computer and blow it up. It takes all the fun out of it. But uh, anyway, it's, it's, so you try to get all that, all that information done. And when you finally make it bigger, mainly working on details, some small areas in the composition. This was one that I, I did. Uh, Sometimes you go back and rework a piece. I did that original Hearts on a Swing that you saw from 20 years before this. And then, then when this uh, little gal, Cammie Crabtree, showed up, I, I asked her if she'd model for me, and, and uh, she did. And, and so I worked on this piece called Hearts on a Swing, and we ended up getting married and having a couple of kids. <laughs> yeah, but she's a real swinger. <laughs> And these are these are a whole bunch of, of uh, nephews. I've got uh, Peter and Peter and Kelly and, and uh, my little uh, what's what's Tommy's daughter's name? No, Libby. 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 Yeah. So I did this piece it's called Water Fight. So there's three different sets of kids here. I, I think I only had pictures of two of them. We should be getting them. There's another one there. That's yeah, a little boy with a Springer Spaniel. And so when it's all going, the water's going and spraying everywhere, and kids, kids have a good time hanging on. But this is, this is really the way you start. You start with a, just a rough sketch like this. And then you take it from here, and you get to a small model, maybe 24-inch model. But this was one we, we did for uh, uh, University of uh, Illinois in Springfield, where, where Abraham Lincoln was... Uh, was there at one time. That's Abraham. There, there he is there. That's, that's the, uh, I guess that's the life size. Yeah. That's old age. That was when he was a lawyer before he had, before he had his beard. So it's, it's fun to do, it's fun to do historical figures and it's, it's really nice when you have enough photographs and of course you have plenty of photographs of people like, uh, like Abraham Lincoln. It's a little bit tougher to get a likeness of somebody when you only have one or two photographs, but then nobody remembers what they look like. So they actually have a lot of freedom. You can make them look a little better. That's what he looked like when he was all finished in bronze. Oh, there's my guys. I've got, uh, right now I've got about eight employees up there in Colorado, and they do most of the work for me. So I don't have to do it. But I've, through the years, I've probably had, I don't know, 100, 150 employees in 50 years. And I would imagine there's 20, 25 of them are out there as sculptors today. I wish I would have broken some of their fingers. <laughs> but, they're, they're, but they're a lot of fun. They come back once in a while and help me out.
<laughs> so it's, okay, this is this is a Thomas Jefferson we did, and that that went in front, also goes in front of a bunch of sporting goods stores. But this this is one piece that when they were taking sculptures out of everywhere where they did they did take a couple of uh, Thomas Jeffersons out of several different universities that we had in there. And uh, they even took a they even took a Ben Franklin out of one school. But luckily there was a school in North Dakota that said we'll take them. <laughs> so they took them. Oh here we go. This is this is a guy named David Crockett and uh, people from uh, San Antonio called me a few years ago and asked me if I'd they were, they were wanting to do a sculpture walk around the Alamo, and, and they said they had a bunch of uh, subjects they had, and I said, well, I, I, I've got one I'd like to do, and they said, yeah, everybody wants to do him. And uh, so I, I said, well, if you, if you find somebody to do it, uh, to pay for it, then, uh, then we'll do it. So they called me back and said, well, we got a hold of a guy named Red McCombs, and Red said if you did the sculpture, you'd pay for it. So I said, great. So Red and I became pretty good friends because I had done a, a, a big life-size piece of Red from the University of Texas uh, a few years before. It's funny how when you give a 50 or $100 million to a the university, they, 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 they push for a sculpture of him in front of the stadium. I remember going to a game. I went to a Nebraska football game down in Texas and in Red's thing there. And I said, now, Red, how come you have such a big a big suite up here on top on the 50 yard line. He said, George, he said, look over there in the corner. He said, you see that sign there? It says, Ricky Williams and Earl Campbell. I said, yeah, I have some trophy winners. He said, you see that name right on top of there, Red McGones. He said, I tried to get him to put that knee on it. <laughs> <laughs> he, was a, he was a great guy, he was a funny guy. He just passed this last year. But anyway, this, this is uh, this is uh, Baby Crockett. And to do him, you have to have all the right stuff. So I, you have to do a lot of research. And, and so I found what his old gun looked like and, and uh, what kind of buckskins he wore. And he did actually wear a coonskin cap at one time. So that was that was a lot of fun to do. And they, they put him in the Alamo and, along with a, a, a bunch of other sculptures. And now they've got him sitting out front, which is it's a nice place to put baby crop. And this is this is how we start. You started with swamp model, and you can see here we're laying up some styrofoam, laying up some styrofoam, and uh, then we put clay on top of that, and maybe we can see it as it comes around a little bit. Well, there you see the, how we how we've got him stand up. He's about ten feet tall, and there, then we've added clay to him. And then you just keep adding clay until it looks like Davy Crockett. <laughs> and there he is. And there he is. There's Baby and me and Baby right there. <laughs> I, still, I, I still got that coonskin cap. My, my studio burned up last year, so I lost uh, almost all that stuff that you see around the pieces here. But I tell everybody, it's you know now my kids don't have to throw it away when they die. <laughs> but here's 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 one of the pieces getting cast at our foundry in Loveland, Colorado. We have two of the best foundries in the world right there in, in town, within ten minutes of my studio, and that's what brought me to Loveland, Colorado, uh, almost fifty years ago. Was I just happenstance walked into the foundry and and I saw the best castings I've ever seen in my life. And, and I had worked in foundries all, all across the country. But I saw these great castings, and I, so I went to the, the guy that owned it, and I said, uh, Mr. Zimmerman, I'd like to have a job here. And he said, what do you do? I said, well, I'm, a, I'm an art teacher. He said, I don't hire any damn artists. <laughs> and so I thought, well, that's the end of that. But a friend of mine that I'd gone in there with, a uh, kid named Marty, he was my old college roommate, he called me back about two months later. He said, George, you still want to move to Loveland, Colorado and work at the foundry? I said, well, sure, but Bob doesn't hire any damn artists. And he said, well, I said, Bob's not hiring. He said, Bob hired me as a new manager, and I'll hire you. Said, well. <laughs> so a month later, I moved out to Loveland, Colorado and, and uh, worked at the foundry for about a year, year and a half. Had a show in Chicago after that, and uh, uh, never had work again. <laughs> So that's when I set up my studio and started working. So I 
you can't see that far on. Oh, that's the foundry again. These are these are called ceramic shells, and this is how they're this is how they're cast. That's the molten bronze going into the shells. I'm sure you guys have had plenty of sculptors show you all that stuff here. Yeah, I'll show you a different different. Really? Well, next time I'll bring a piece of clay and we'll go through the whole thing. <laughs> oh, there's David Crockett at the Alamo. Oh, there's David Crockett in front of the Alamo. I haven't been down there since they put it in front of the Alamo. I have. It's great. What, did you see it? Yep. Oh, cool. Did you take a picture of it? Yep. Yeah. Can I see it? No. <laughs> Okay, this is this is a this is a sculpture I did uh, for the uh, Denver Rotary Club called the Branch Ricky Award, and they gave it to the professional baseball player that did the most for his community. And so we uh, did this piece. It's about 12 feet tall, and it sits in front of Coors Field. I think there's is there another shot of that with the yeah there we go. And so he's right there, right as you come in the front door. Now this one, this one was uh, this was interesting to work on this piece. It was a, a guy named uh, Nicky Hayden. He was the uh, only American to ever win the uh, the uh, Formula One uh, motorcycle races and that, that is in Europe and all around the world. But unfortunately, he was killed in a bicycle accident in Italy about four years ago. That's his brother Tommy. The three brothers were the only three brothers that ever held every every championship, motorcycle championship in the United States at one time. But uh, we did Mickey for his hometown of uh, Owensboro, Kentucky. And so that was that was kind of an interesting piece to do. That's a, that's a Honda that goes 200 miles an hour. And this is, a, this is a piece I did for the University of Illinois. They called me and asked me if I'd like to do submit an idea for Red Grange, and I said, well, sure. And they said, we have three or four other sculptors that are interested in doing Red Grange, and I said, and which one of them graduated from the University of Illinois? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, gotta, you gotta pull your weight when you can. <laughs> so, we did, uh, so we did Red Grange and put him out in front of the, uh, he's about 15 feet tall, he's a big piece. Uh, and then, we, then when we got done with him, about four years later, they called me and said, would you like to do, oh, what's this guy's name? Oh, Dick Butts, that's right. Anyway, and uh, the first three meetings I had with Dick, he wouldn't even talk to me because he didn't want to be done in sculpture. He said, if you can't do the whole team, I don't want to be done. And finally, the uh, athletic director called up Dick and said, listen, Dick, this really isn't for you, it's for the university. And it's for all your players, and, and then he got Jim Grabowski to call him. And finally, Dick said, okay. And so I put some uh, models together, took them out to California. He picked out the white light. And so we, we did this. He's about 12 feet tall. And there you go. All the guys can help me work on it. And there's the, uh, that's the piece. When you're a sculptor, you have to depend on a lot of people to help you. And even when you uh, go off and get a piece set, most of these guys, you know, they've done construction all their lives, but you put a piece of sculpture in front of them, and they, they're wondering, you know, how do we pick this? Is it going to break? And, and so it's, it's kind of fun to be there because they really can't hurt it. And uh, it's, it's kind of fun to deal with them. But, but when they do it, you, you end up being friends with most of them because they, they just have a ball when they finally get it set and they breathe a sigh of relief and so do I. <laughs> but that's me underneath the, uh, the shroud there. It was a windy day so I was trying to hold the shroud together. But that's how big old Dick was there. And there's, there's, there's Dick standing looking at himself. That's, that's kind of a fun fun thing when you have something like that. <clears throat> He's a pretty mean guy, <laughs> but he's a, he's a, he's a guy, anytime he gives a speech, he almost always starts crying, because he's just such a softie. He's, he's a cool guy. And here's some more, this is a piece I did for a, a city called Palm Beach, Florida. They have, a, they, they, they have a baseball thing called the Miracle League. I don't know if you have one here in Tucson, 
but you might. It's a it's a baseball field that they make with a rubber rubber thing. It's about half the size of a little league field, but but all the kids that play are disabled children, and every disabled children child has a uh, a partner. I can't remember what they call it, but but it's a kid that helps them out all the time. And so they play these baseball games, and they're able to finally get in and, and play a sport. And the neatest thing is, they said it does the kid that helps the, the challenged kid more so than it does the challenged kid, which I thought was kind of cool. So we did, uh, we did him, and uh, I used my little, uh, my daughter Carlene, uh, she modeled for this one. I have a little nephew that's uh, Down syndrome. Uh, Lee I for this kid and then uh, this uh, I did a, a black kid who's about 12 years old and his name was Eldrick later called Tiger but I didn't tell anybody and he lives about a mile away from the sculpture I don't know if he's ever seen it but I used, I used him as the model these are a few pieces we do for uh, a company called Shield Sporting Goods they're just building a new sporting goods store up in Phoenix and whenever they do a new store, they they put four of these 12-foot uh, pieces out in front of the store. And I asked Steve Shield one day, this was about 10 years ago, I said, now Steve, how can you want to put these big pieces out in front? He said, well, George, there's all these new signage regulations. <clears throat> and he said, we, we can only put up so many signs. And he said, I put you guys a sculpture up there. And he said, they show people what we sell, so we've got a hunter, a fisherman, a bicycler, and, and then we have a big snowboarder that's not in the picture here. But uh, he says, so we show everybody what we sell, and he said, they not only don't regulate me, he said, they give me awards for it. <laughs> so every time they, they have about 30 stores, so it's a pretty good contract. This is a sculpture of a guy named uh, L. Ray Jefferson. If any of you are pilots, you flew by what were called jet charts. And uh, he was a man who invented airline navigation back in the 20s and 30s. And when they built the new Denver airport, they started, uh, or they named a new terminal after Captain Jefferson. And Jeff was still alive. And so he would come up every week and help me work on his sculpture. And I remember his wife, Nadine, she'd come in and she'd look at him. And I said, Nate, Nate, or Jeff Ashley one day, Nate, was that that good looking when I was younger? And she'd say, no. <laughs> you weren't. And then this is, this is a model we did for a competition to do a gal named Amelia Earhart for the Capitol building in Washington. And uh, so we did her and her, her hat and her leather jacket and her job purse and her her boots and her scarf blowing in the wind. And we made it into the top five, but they called, called us, my brother Mark and I were working on this. They called us and said, well, you made the top five, <clears throat> but the, your family likes, likes your piece a lot, but, but they don't like the goggles and the cap or the jobbers or the boots. <laughs> you know, she would have been naked. <laughs> So we changed it around, we put a pair of slacks on her and kept, we kept the scarf and the, and the jacket and uh, there might be another shot here of her with the, yeah, you can see the goggles and the cap in her left hand. And so that's what we went with, we got the competition and, and about 10 years later we were able to make her uh, seven feet tall and there, there she is there. And uh, there she is in the Capitol building. She stands now in the rotunda in Washington. So that's, that's kind of neat. What's that? Oh, can you see it over there too? Oh, you got two of them. Look at that. They might be tired of looking at your back. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Nice, Chuck. Don't worry about that. He's my stage manager. Okay, so here's, that was Amelia Earhart. And she was the second one we, we got to put in the Capitol building. The first one was a guy named Jack Swigert, an astronaut. And we did Jack, and when we, when we did Jack Swigert, we got him all done, and we were working on the patina, and we put a dark patina on him, and he looked just like a deep sea diver, because he had a, well, here, he's like the one on the, on the left here. 
and he looked like a deep sea diver, and so we, we then we painted his, his uh, 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 outfit or his uh, suit, his space suit, white, and, and did all the painting, and you know, did his name and everything. And we sent it to Washington, and the architect of the Capitol building wouldn't accept it because they said, we don't want anything with a painted patina. We want it to look like the rest. And I said, well, he looked like a deep sea diver. And the architect said, well, I guess we'll have to change it after we dedicate it because it was too late. <clears throat> and so I had a meeting with uh, uh, my senator from Nebraska, a friend of mine named Bob Carey. And he, he said, let's get this other guy in here. When I told him about that, and so he brought in John Glenn. John Glenn says, I like it. We're not going to change it. <laughs> so, I think the architect left the next year. <laughs> I'll bet it was. Okay, so this is this is what we did for the uh, uh, Kennedy Space Center uh, for the Apollo 11, the 50th anniversary. And you got uh, Collins and Armstrong and, and Buzz. And this is Buzz. He came out to the studio to see himself from 50 years before. And he had... He was 90 years old at that time. He flew in from L.A. and spent an afternoon with us and went, drove back to Denver, hopped on an airplane, and flew to Florida. Wow. So he, he just got married about two months ago. <laughs> so, and this, this is another joint project. I'm working with a young guy named Joey Boehner that's worked with us for about 10 years. And my brother Mark and myself there in the back. I'm the good-looking guy back there. <laughs> And this is uh, this is Buzz. There he is. There he's holding the flag. And this is how we, this is how we shipped him. Uh, an outfit called Rocket Mortgage was the main sponsor for it, so they sent out a nice trailer and had it all painted up, and they stopped all the way along the way and and showed kids uh, sculpture, which was, it was it was pretty cool. But that's all. That, that's that's my crew right there with a couple extra kids. And that's what they looked like when they were all set in, in, uh, in, the, in the Space Center. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, I wish I had critics like you a long time ago. <laughs> this was another one. Since we did the Apollo 11, then they came to us and said, well, would you like to do Apollo 13 uh, for the Johnson Space Center? So we did, and we... Uh, we uh, got these guys, and, and I remember calling uh, Jim Jim Lovell, and uh, I sent him a bunch of photographs, and I said, uh, how do you want to be done? Because he, they also wore spacesuits and stuff like that. And Jim said, you know, he said, I think I want to be done, or I think we would like to be done getting off the helicopter when we landed, because if you remember, the Apollo 13 was kind of a, a tough mission. And he said, the happiest day in my life, the happiest time of my life was the day I jumped off the helicopter onto the Iwo Jima uh, aircraft carrier. So that's, this is those guys all getting off of the, uh, the aircraft carrier. And we had this piece almost all finished. <clears throat> and, and the guy from the museum called me. And you know, museum people, and a museum person, will tell us that they're really sticklers for detail. And he looked at the piece, he looked at Jim Lovell's hand and said, you don't have his ring on. And I said, did he have a wedding ring? No, it doesn't look like a wedding ring. So I called Jim and I said, Jim, what kind of ring do you wear on your finger? Or did you wear on your finger when you were going to the moon? And he said, well, I said, that's my 1952 Naval Academy ring. And I said, can you take a picture of it? And so he did. And it was so worn out, you couldn't tell what it was. And so I, I got a hold of the ring company that made it. And I said, is there any way that we can figure out how what this ring looked like when it was new? Because that's it was still new looking when he was on the space spaceship. And they, they said, well, I, uh, I don't know. And I said, well, this might be the only ring that ever went around the moon eight times. <laughs> and two weeks later, I got a copy of it in wax, a three-dimensional copy of that ring. And so we just used it. We actually put that ring on his finger, and it was, it was perfect. So it worked out pretty good. 
And Jim was amazed because he said, I forgot what it looked like. He said, oh, you couldn't tell what it was, it was just worn out. But here's here Jim and uh, uh, not Collins, what's his name? I'll think of it. Anyway. Anyway, Jack Swagger was also on that uh, ride, but he, he passed away years ago. But here they are coming in, and the museum did a wonderful job there and did a big, big uh, two-dimensional helicopter, and then we did the stairway coming down, so that's those guys getting off of the uh, helicopter. Well, here's your, here's our latest astronaut. This is Sally Ride. And we had Sally all finished up. We just had the film crew in and taking pictures of it. <clears throat> and then uh, we have another picture there. And then the fire hit the studio and, and she burned up. So we still had we still had a deadline to make. So we we worked we worked day and night and got her got her together in about three months. And, and luckily with our founders in Loveland, uh, and of course we we try to maintain good friends with them. It's difficult because they're difficult, difficult people. <laughs> no, they're all old friends. But anyway, we got her done and put her up in front of the uh, uh, the Museum of Flight there in uh, Long Island. That's where uh, that's where Lindbergh took off. And while I was out there, I was trying to. I said, "Why don't you have a big statue of Lindbergh here?" <laughs> I know a guy that can do it. <laughs> you got to work in this business. <laughs> Anyway, that, that was uh, Sally Ride. We're going to put up another Sally Ride. A copy of it goes into the Reagan Library here on July 4th, oh, wow. this year. This is the last piece that I've worked on. Uh, we started this about three years ago. This is a guy named General Maurice Rose. And he was the highest ranking American soldier killed in Europe in World War II. And he was also the only Jewish American general. But he could never tell anybody he was Jewish because then he would never become general. But anyway, this is how big uh, this is how big General Rose is. And he all, he also got burned up in the fire. Oh, oh, now we're going into Western art. Okay, here we go. So friends of Western art, I thought I'd better do some Western art pieces. So last week I I got together and I, I put put this one together called. Uh, wait for an answer. I just did that originally for a guy that had the Lean and Tree uh, card company up in Boulder. You guys, you guys, Western Art, you probably bought a lot of these cards at one time. <laughs> Neat guy named Ed, Ed Trump. But that's, that's, uh, and we had that out of Mule Power for a while. Yeah. And this is one called Home Sweet Home. Old cowboy, and this is uh, this is called uh, Rare and Ride, and it's piece said did in a little little cowboy a long time ago. And this was one called the Flatlander. It's an old guy leaning on his side. That reminded me of my grandfather when I was growing up in Central America, Nebraska. <laughs> You wonder why I didn't have a Spanish accent, did you? <laughs> Now we get to the good stuff. This is all done by Cammy Lundy, the better sculptor in the family. <laughs> Cammy loves her animals. Uh, when, we, when she has a list of who she loves in the farmyard, I'm number 17. <laughs> but we'll go through some of these. That's a big life-size piece. Oh, Cammy didn't do that one. I did that one. Oh, now we're on Lewis and Clark. That's somehow Cammy got raced in there real quick. But there's more of Cammy to come. This is a piece I did uh, when Lewis and Clark had their 200th uh, anniversary, and this one was done for uh, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. I don't think Lewis and Clark ever went through there, but they had some folks that decided to put it in front of their museum up there. And I'm getting in trouble now because uh, I get some Native Americans who don't like to have a Native uh, American flag with Native Americans, but uh, my good friend uh, uh, Ben Nighthorse Campbell was a senator from Colorado. I called Ben, I said, Ben, I said, you have any problem with me having a little 
a little Native American kid holding up an American flag. He said, no, he said, he said the American Indian is the only group in the United States that has fought in every war in the United, of the United States. He said, in fact, we've been fighting terrorists since 1492. <laughs> Anyway, these are some photographs of the uh, clay pieces as we were working on. And there's the dog seaman there, the big Newfoundland. That's a little piece I did called Pete Pine Needle. My little <clears throat> nephew, Peter Lundin, he's now about 40 years old. I think Pine Needle's still alive. <laughs> no? Yeah, he'd only be about 55. Yeah. <laughs> There's the beautiful Cammy Lundin right there. Yeah. Uh, here's one she did. This is this slide. Is that what you call it? Mm -hmm. Cammy's had horses most of her life. <clears throat> She's driven horses. Uh, she was a. Uh, she was the. Uh, I think the first lady taxi driver on Agnan Island that had a license oh. to drive. <laughs> and they haven't had them very long. She's not very old. <laughs> but she just does some really, really nice horses. And other animals. She does a lot of animals. And she has a lot of animals. I counted over <laughs> 75 animals one day from a front porch. That's called a little lazy, I think, isn't it? Uh -huh. Yeah, it's an old mule. And there's going to Falls of Plunk Creek. And there's, there's my favorite called Mod and Lottie, which is a big piece of two draft horses snuggling up to each other. And that's called uh, Pretty in Chinks. Yeah, that. She was pretty in shape. <laughs> oh yeah. We're going backwards now. There we go. What's that called? Lunch break. Lunch break. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that neat? Yeah. And then as we get done, I like to always uh, uh, thank our veterans. This is what I did for my father. That's in front of my hometown courthouse. It's called Field of Blue. And then this other one we did, uh, this also goes in front of the Shield Sporting Goods stores, in front of all their new stores now. And that was a fun one to do. And then, and then we go, as we say goodbye, there's, a, there's old Red Grange as we're sitting on the sunset. So I'd like to thank you guys all for coming and thank the friends of us tonight. You guys do a great job, and you got a wonderful organization here. Thanks. I've got a little token of our appreciation, George. A check? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you could probably you could probably sculpt a check out of that. Hey, that's nice. Look at that. That's real leather. Real leather. <laughs> we don't even get those for ourselves. So. <laughs> Barb, you want to make some closing remarks? No, you go right ahead. Oh, any questions? <laughs> yeah. Any, are there any questions? How many additions are there to a lot of these? Well, when you're a sculptor, you, 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 you finish up with a piece and you, you look at it and you think, how many of these darn things can I sell? Uh, but you try to, you try to, you know, on the big ones, you don't make very many. Maybe you make one. Uh, sometimes you make more than one. Some of the life-size pieces, I wish I would have made 50 of, because then I wouldn't be quite as starving an artist as I am today. But uh, no, we try, and, you know, smaller pieces, you usually make more in the addition, larger pieces, smaller ones. Mel, do you have a question? Mel, do you have a question? 
That was my question. I was at, uh, oh, you, you, you. Can you talk about the physicality? Because these are these are big, heavy pieces. Well, uh, Hugh, we have a forklift, <laughs> and, and, we, and I've got a bunch of guys up there in Colorado with, <clears throat> I describe them as having big shirts and small hats. <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't like that. <laughs> no, 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 Hank, Hank, you wouldn't like that either. <laughs> George, is there, is there one figure from American history or contemporary life that you would really like to take on at this point? Oh, one, one person? Yeah. Oh, gosh. I, I don't know. I, I, I've been, we've been lucky enough to do a number of uh, really cool people. In fact, uh, I called Emma Rose about seven years ago when a guy called us and they wanted to do the 14 Stations of the Cross for a, uh, in fact, I should have put some shots in here of these. But we did, uh, we did 14 stations, and we had 10 sculptors working together for about two and a half years, working with similar models, similar drapery, uh, uh, different compositions on each piece, and all of the figures were seven foot figures, so they were all pretty big. And we did over, I think it was 60, 65 different figures for the composition. But uh, if you get on the internet, you'll, uh, Punch up stations of the cross, the cloisters. It's uh, it's outside of Omaha, <clears throat> and uh, they they have these big pieces out there. A guy built a beautiful, big uh, retreat area, a Catholic retreat. And then we were fortunate enough this past year we're we're building the second set of them for uh, uh, a church just outside of Kalamazoo, Michigan. So that's where we'll be going this summer, quite a bit of the summer. Okay. One more hey, question. Uh, we saw you a while back at Sunday's West, and you were talking about a foundation that you're a part of, or that deals with artists. Uh, oh, well, years and years ago, I, I had a little gal that worked, worked with me that got cancer. And even though we had really good insurance, uh, she had a little daughter, and she wasn't able to, you know, you, they take care of the health part of it, the medical bills, but all of a sudden you can't pay your rent, you can't pay your mortgage, you got all kinds of different things you have to pay for. So we started a little thing called the Artist Charitable Fund, where once a year we have an auction in Loveland in conjunction with our uh, big sculpture show there in the summer. And we've been able to, in the last 30 years or so, raise nearly a million dollars uh, to uh, help uh, lots of artists out through the years with their medical bills, dental bills. Like I need to thank all of the artists because every year we get some terrific paintings and we'll, we'll sell forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 worth of artwork in about an hour and a half. And it's easy to be the auctioneer of that because I've always got a lot of bidders. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, George. Thanks a lot.